All right. Thanks a lot, Ryan. And thank you all for joining us today. So what we're going to talk about today is RFSOC, which uh, has turned out to be one of the most exciting products that we've been involved in in our near, over 34 years now in, in the uh, history of Pentech. So we're going to talk about uh, several topics. We're going to talk about the um, kind of the features and the functions, what's inside the RFSOC chip itself, and then what does it do? What do those features do for the market? Why are uh, people having, you know, questions about how am I going to use this product? Because it is quite sophisticated. And then ways that we make it easier for customers to use, including our small modular Quartz XM module and how it can be transported to different form factors very easily. We'll talk a little bit about the development tools, not only for the FPGA, but also for the software, the ARM processor that's um, part of the chip itself. So um, let's get started. Back in February of 2017, Xilinx announced this first chip as an integrated RF class analog device, but they called it a disruptive technology because it really does things that have never been done before by combining the RF and the FPGA and the processing um, elements of software radio all into a single device. And that's quite, kind of what the remarkable part of it was. Well, as soon as they announced this, um, our customers got word of that news. And these are some of our customers. You might recognize some of them even. Um, they just loved it. They heard about it and they couldn't get enough of it. So we started paying attention to what our customers were saying and we decided we should look at it a little bit further. So looking inside the RFSOC chip itself, first of all, it's built on a Zinc Ultrascale Plus platform. And that is uh, Xilinx's um, latest, the Ultrascale Plus is, is their latest uh, family. Um, uh, the next one is, is gonna be Versile, that's coming. Right now, the Ultrascale Plus is is uh, where they are. It's 16 nanometer uh, dimensioned on the uh, fabric itself. It contains a lot of resources. It contains um, fabric for doing the DSP processing engines and so forth. And it also has a lot of I.O. It has high performance GPIO and very high density. So it's great for connecting to peripherals. It also has support for a lot of different types of RAM, including internal RAM, uh, block and ultra RAM, and external DDR memory. It has a PCI Express Gen 4 interface, <clears throat> and it has um, gigabit serial, 100 gigabit uh, Ethernet serial support, where you can then connect up directly to the chip uh, using an internal EMAC to 100 gigabit Ethernet connections for getting data on and off the chip very easily. So you can see this is the fabric itself, the, the zinc fabric in the Ultrascale Plus. But that's not all. Besides that, what Xilinx did was embedded data converters, A to Ds and D to A converters on this device that are connected directly to the FPGA fabric. The benefit here is that the connections between the data converters and the FPGA are often uh, responsible for a lot of printed circuit board design and interface design and interface power. Now these interfaces are local to the chip itself. And so not only it saves power, but it saves latency between the data converters and the FPGA fabric that's either the destination or the source of the digitized signals for those data converters. The A to Ds, um, there are eight of them, 12-bit, four giga sample per second, includes digital down converters, and the D to A's, 14-bit resolution, 6.4 giga sample per second, integrated digital up converters. Again, built right into the same device with the, the rest of the resources we looked at in the last slide. But that's not all. It also includes a farm of ARM processors. It's a, it has basically four ARM Cortex-A53 processors. Um, it has um, Cortex-R5 real-time processors all built onto the same device. So what it really gives you, it really gives you a complete RF system, including uh, the digitizers, the FPGA fabric for doing real-time DSP, and also the processor for doing the control of, of that system, uh, all on a single chip 
You connect up external DDR4 memory, external high-speed interfaces, and what you've got is a complete subsystem on a single monolithic chip. It's quite remarkable. So what does that mean? How does it change the market? How does it change, you know, products? Well, in terms of where it's addressed mostly is, is radar. I mean, this is where we see it as Millero customer, even though it was announced as a 5G wireless product by Xilinx, that's, that's maybe where their major market is. But for Pentec and our customers, we're Mill Arrow. And what we try to do is we, we try to use the latest devices for things like radar, phased array radar, um, um, commercial radars, EW, and countermeasures, especially important for the, the low latency feature of this chip that can address both of those very nicely. Communications, uh, SATCOM as well as, as military radios, SIGINT, monitoring, interception, analysis. And yes, it can also do quite a nice job for 5G wireless. We do have a lot of mil military and government customers inter interested in intercepting um, for doing SIGINT and other applications on 5G wireless type signals. So it really cuts across most of the software radio markets that we address and that probably many of you are involved in. How does it change the market? Well, first of all, if you take a look at each of the functions that are inside the uh, RFSOC, if you had to implement them discreetly, you'd need different blocks for each one. But now with the RFSOC, you've got everything in a single device. So what you wind up with, with is about half the space that you'd need to do the discrete implementation, less power, less cost, and greatly reduced latency because Instead of the JESD 204B interface, which is the traditional very high-speed uh, data converter interface standard used in most of the latest high-speed wideband data converter products, these devices that are on the RFSOC chip are fully parallel, going into um, like 128-bit wide parallel buses right on the fabric itself. What do all these things mean? How do they change the market? Well, first of all, it lets you get the software-defined radio functions closer to the antenna because it's in a smaller place. It provides transceiver links in, in RF frequencies, and it's wideband because of the sampling rates. You can get longer missions for UAVs. The vehicles can be smarter, smaller, and lower weight, especially nice for airborne. It also improves the density for phased arrays, which are so common in a lot of platforms, um, airborne and land, as well as shipborne phased arrays, where you have a lot of antenna elements that need each to be connected to a data converter. It's great dynamic range. The low latency is really important for EW and countermeasures, great for remote monitoring and censoring. And in general, kind of in summary, it really opens up uh, new applications that previously were not practical because of the, the much larger size that these functions required, power, weight, size, swap, the whole thing, than uh, as previously required. Now those can be shrunk to a much smaller footprint and put in places that never were more, that never before were really practical. So we immediately, uh, having have, you know, we were a Xilinx uh, partner for decades. We said, let's jump in on this and get get started doing a design. We were immediately approved as beta site for um, for working on the RFSOC chip by Xilinx, and so we started to take a look at what it's going to take to design with the RFSOC chip. Now, this is the uh, ball grid array package, um, and I'm not expecting you to know what all those colors mean, but in the, the various interfaces that this chip needs, is it needs good signal integrity for the 16 analog RF signals that have you know, many gigahertz of signal bandwidth that has to be clean uh, so it doesn't get it doesn't pick up digital spurious signals, it doesn't radiate between the channels causing crosstalk problems and other issues. And you have to maintain a very high uh, integrity path with very controlled impedances to make sure that those connections to the chip 
uh, out through to the outside world are maintained and, and kind of pristine. There's a lot of clocks. There's data converter clocks, there's FPGA fabric clocks, and there's also clocks for the gigabit serial links as well. So it's a complicated clock uh, environment with many different frequencies. It has very high speed, uh, 28 gigabit lanes, four of which are used to implement the two uh, or each of the 100 gigabit ethernet links. And so you have a total of eight of those lanes using uh, you know, a total of eight for two uh, groups of four for the dual 100 gigabit Ethernet. And those, again, have to be very, very uh, highly controlled in terms of, of impedance and um, feed throughs and vias and so forth to, to maintain very low bit error rates at those frequencies. And to make things a little bit more interesting, the chip requires 13 different power supplies. Some of them are very high current. You need uh, like 40 amps at 0.8 volts. You need some very highly regulated uh, power supplies for certain other certain interfaces. You need very clean supplies for the analog circuitry so that the power supply doesn't um, uh, couple into the data converter signals and cause um, you know signal integrity issues there. You have a lot of different signals connecting up to the ARM processor, things that are, you know, traditionally just associate things like gigabit Ethernet, USB serial processor type I.O. And there are two banks of uh, DDR4 SD RAMs operating at cycle times of 24 mega transfers per second uh, for reads or writes uh, in and out of the chip. One, one bank is for the processor and the other bank is for the FPGA fabric. And then, of course, you've got to work on thermal management to make sure whatever you do with this chip, wherever you put it, you're going to be successful in bringing the heat off the chip um, so that it can operate um, according to its uh, thermal specifications. So what we try to do is say, well, gee, this is, this is a, you know, kind of a complicated chip to design with. Let's say a customer really loves the chip, they want to start using it, how are they going to get it into their final product in the least amount of time, least amount of effort, hardware design, FPGA design, doing the ARM processor software development. So what is the shortest path for customers to get there and how can they get a running start? That was the challenge that we had when we came up scratching our head, trying to figure out exactly what, what kind of product offering we should make. We did have a couple of good, um, you know, uh, sessions with our customers to try to find out what do you really want? What do you really want to do with it? What, what, are, what are the things that you need? We found out that we presented our traditional embedded system boards like, for example, 3UVPX, uh, PCI Express. Um, some customers could use that and, and in some applications. But a lot of customers were looking for something that were smaller. They just couldn't fit a 3U VPX card or a PCI Express card in the application space that um, they needed to deploy this, uh, this technology. So, you know, because of that, we decided to come up with a product strategy where we could give standard form factor products, but also have people who have very small form factor requirements to still be successful in using the chip. So we came out with the concept of the Quartz XM. Quartz is the trade name for our RFSOC products, and XM stands for Express Module. And what it is, it's kind of a, a small module that, that contains all the critical infrastructure for the care and feeding of the chip and the I.O. connectivity for all those critical signals uh, on a single module that's, that's very compact, very efficient, space, size, weight, power that can be then used on a lot of different carriers, including custom carriers as well as standard form factor carriers. Uh, it's 4 inches by 2.5 inches, so it's quite compact. It's about a little bit larger than a, than a playing card. And again designed to be used on many carriers with tough size, weight, and power requirements. Some of the technical details of the module, 28 layers, uh, 4,000 holes, sequential lamination, back drilling, uh, blind and buried vias, 
And some of the back drilling, for example, is there to maintain the barrel uh, of the plated through holes so that it only uh, tri uh, it only exists between the two connected layers and doesn't go to the top and bottom side, which would give you an impedance mismatch. It's, a, it's like a stub antenna. So back drilling eliminates those stub antennas that are actually inside part of the barrel, if not back drilled, to remove the copper. And one of the big challenge was to um, support the 28 gigabit uh, GTY interfaces to support the 100 gigabit Ethernet. Now this board went through uh, so, uh, three different sessions of um, of modeling, of signal integrity analysis with different vendors. Each time we came back, we got more recommendations, changed this a little bit. So it was an iterative process. It took us, you know, over a year to try to get the, the layering right, the, the traces right, and the, the layout correct to, to maintain the operation and the signal integrity that we needed uh, to have a, a, a product that we'd be proud of. If you take a look at what's inside, um, here's a block diagram of it. <clears throat> and what you see uh, in, the, in the diagram, you see in the center kind of a pink colored uh, block, which is the chip itself, the Zinc Ultrascale Plus, and then the gray larger block around it is the module itself. And the circuitry that you see on the gray is the uh, circuits that are then on the module. So let's just take a look at what's there. First of all, we have a power management system, which is basically a bank of power supplies that contains all 13 power supplies required for the module driven from a single 12-volt source input. So it eliminates all the power supply regulation uh, and and uh, filtering and uh, you know all of the other issues that are associated with all those different 13 power supplies. It makes it very simple for a user to, to supply a single 12 volt input. We have clock management circuitry that that manages the sampling clocks, it manages the fabric clocks, it manages the processor clocks, and the um, uh, gigabit serial clocks as well. We have two banks of, um, these are uh, eight and 10, actually it's two eight banks, eight gigabyte uh, banks of DDR4 SD RAM. One of them is for the fabric, one of them is for the processor. We have flash memory, so you can load a boot configuration file to automatically boot up the system. The processor then takes uh, that boot and it loads and configures the FPGA with its configuration file. And then very importantly, we have connectors that will bring the signals from the chip out to connectors. So you can see here, we've highlighted the analog RF IO connections, which are using, uh, as you can see, they're outlined in the, uh, in the photo on the upper right. These are called Samtech ISO rate connectors. And these are connectors rated to 12 gigahertz bandwidth. We're bringing out the, di the differential analog signals uh, in and out to the A to Ds and D to As on these lines. We're also bringing out on another Samtech called the C-Ray connection uh, connector family, very high speed uh, clocks for the A to D converters, for the D to A converters um, to, through these pins. And then we have a, um, a high density C-Ray connector that brings in all the power supplies, all the processor I.O., the um, I.O. to the chip for the GTYs to support the um, gigabit, uh, 100 gigabit Ethernet, the GPIO, the PCI Express, all of, all of those other uh, signals are brought out through that second connector. So this then is the basis for our product offering called Quartz. One of the first platforms we wanted to put this on so that customers could actually buy the Quartz technology would be a 3U VPX board. It's uh, one of our main uh, form factors that we support. There are a lot of new standards for uh, VPX. We'll be looking at a couple of those, but we wanted to take advantage of the latest ones that are available, which include optical backplane IO, coaxial RF backplane IO, and some of the new ones have really nice high density connections that will support, uh, as you can see on the lower uh, left there, two different interfaces that uh, each support 10 coaxial RF connections 
and a MT ferrule all in a half of P2, the VPX P2. And you can have two of those for up to 20 uh, IORF lines and up to uh, 24 uh, optical MT lanes coming out. So this then is our model 5950, which is a 3U VPX carrier for the Quartz XM module. And it then, of course, takes the module. It has matching connectors for the analog and all the digital and power supply connections. And it is an open, very popular uh, open architecture form factor, of course, following Vita 65, which is open VPX. We also included uh, 28 uh, gigabaud optical transceivers that take the GTY signals from the Quartz XM module through optical transceivers so that you can come out to the rear panel uh, on the backplane VPX with, with uh, dual 100 gigabit ethernet lanes, optical lanes. The front panel contains uh, coaxial connections. The, the coaxial connections on the front panel go through balance, which then go into those differential pins on the Quartz XM module. Again, maintaining uh, signal integrity all the way along along with some of the other clocks that, that come out. So now <clears throat> you've got a, a really complete functional subsystem on a 3U VPX to support high channel count and also support synchronization across multiple modules. We'll talk about that later. This is the block diagram of the Quartz um, 5950, the 3U VPX board. So what you're looking at here in this blue outline, this is this is the outline of the board. And as you go towards the center, you again see the chip that's in kind of pink color. And then you see the gray block, which is the Quartz XM module. And now this larger white block is the printed circuit board for the Quartz 5950 3U VPX carrier. So you can see that the connections um, uh, then are brought out to the appropriate VPX uh, connection points, including out to the rear panel where they go across the back plane to a rear uh, transition module, which, which then, excuse me, go back up here, which then makes it easy for the uh, processor IO, like the gigabit ethernet and USB and RS-232 and so forth, to be connected up to the rear panel of the 3U VPX enclosure with easy connections to the, um, the module's processor interface. Uh, it also includes a synchronization feature, which we'll, we'll get to in just a minute. So the first product, our Quartz 6001 XM module, then is used on the 3U, this is um, air-cooled and conduction-cooled 3U VPX. We've been shipping these boards since October of 2018. So we've got a lot of customers, a lot of units in the field at this time. To make it easier for our customers to do development, we came up with a relatively simple single slot 3U VPX chassis that's shown here. It's made for us by Elma, and it includes a single slot backplane and includes power supply and cooling and the idea here is to install the 5950 in this box to make it really easy for customers to do development, get started with development immediately. Um, you don't need a single board computer, as you might think in most 3U VPX systems, you have a single board computer acting as your system controller. But now the ARM processor that's on the RFSOC chip itself takes the place of the system controller, and so you can do this whole thing in a single slot. We can also we also sell other chassis for doing different kinds of development or end applications, but this is a good one, a good way to get started. So here's the front, and here's the rear. Now on the rear view, what you're looking at, um, the 5950s in the front, but then the rear transition module plugs into the back and engages with the backplane to bring the, ping, the, the pins for the processor I.O. out to convenient to use RJ45, USB connections, and other standard interfaces so you can plug uh, directly into them 
very, very easily. You'll also notice that there are MPO optical connectors that connect each one to a 100 gigabit Ethernet connection that's optical that goes through the Vita 66.4 backplane interface. So you can connect up standard MPO cables to those 100 gigabit Ethernet uh, ports that are shown on the back. So that's the, the, the second offering, and this has been shipping since November of 2018. So to develop what you need, basically, here's a larger view of the rear transition module that you see on the back. You need a PC, it could be laptop, could be a workstation, and you connect up to the rear transition module using standard connections that are useful for various parts of your development task to that processor. You load the workstation up with the Xilinx Vivado tools for RFSOC and with Pentex Navigator Design Suite, which includes FPGA tools and software tools. Together, they give you everything you need to do software and FPGA development for the RFSOC uh, chip itself. We've also added the 5903, which is a quartz synchronization board. This allows you to synchronize up to eight different quartz boards, like, for example, the 5950. What it does is it generates the sample clocks and the required associated clocks and synchronization signals that each of those boards needs to get in order, so, in order to have complete alignment across all the channels in each of those eight boards so that the sample clock and across all, let's say, 64 channels picks up exactly at the same sample across those channels, making a completely synchronous operation, which is essential for beam forming and other phased array applications. And uh, the synchronization is accurate to a single cycle. That's both for the A to D and the D to A. This board is programmed uh, over USB, which can come in either through the front or the rear panel. Uh, you only take power basically from the back plane, so it's a kind of a standalone programmed over v USB. It's 3U VPX form factor, um, air-cooled, conduction-cooled versions available. And you can see the four connections there. These are on the front panel that provide the four sync signals that are needed to go each to one of the destination uh, quartz modules. So you have four cables going from this front panel to four of the 5950s across uh, into their um, uh, sync connectors. We also have a rear transition module for the sync board that, that brings the sync, four of the sync connections out through to the rear panel. So if you wanna connect the sync cables across the rear panel, you can use those as well. So that's the synchronization board. Very, it took us a long time and a lot of work with Xilinx to get everything done right. And some of the documentation was still a moving target as we, um, for the first couple of years of our working on this product. So, but now it's, it's done, it's working great. So that's our sync generator module, model 5903. But remember, in the beginning, we said we wanted to have customers be able to use the um, Quartz XM module to make their own carrier for, for their own custom application carrier. So what we developed was a carrier design package called the Model 4801 that gives the customer everything that they need to design their own carrier for the Quartz XM module. And it's a, a huge documentation package that's all hyperlinked um, to different sections. Um, it, it's extremely easy to use, extremely uh, easy to get to different uh, functions and features within, you know, menu-driven dri and hyperlinks. Um, for example, it gives you the complete pin definition of the Quartz XM module, like which, which pin of the module goes to which pin of the FPGA. Uh, complete 3D mechanical modules of the Quartz XM module, so you can design your carrier board so that it fits perfectly with the um, Quartz XM module. Thermal profiles of the module and components. We give you a complete schematic of the Model 5950 carrier 
which is our 3U VPX carrier for the Quartz XM module, that you can you know you can basically copy what you need, adapt what you need to your own um, custom carrier, so that you can you know take everything we've got that works and and is proven to work and uh, use it as you wish. We also give you PCB stackup recommendations, which layers, which thickness, which material, you know, power grounds, signal grounds, and so forth, um, in helping you make up your printed circuit board layout in a similar way. We provide uh, design guidelines, routing rules, operating system, and bootstrap guidelines. We also include a complete uh, review, a critical review of your design as you get near the end of it to give you any feedback uh, from our experts here at Pentec as to what you might want to change or you, you might want to have some um, signal integrity analysis on uh, to make it, uh, you know, uh, you know, a better design. And that's included in the design package. And that's this additional guidance that I'm, that we're talking about here. Um, it requires an NDA. We don't want you to make um, the Quartz XM module yourself. We don't want you to make a 3U VPX carrier because we've got that, but you can basically make uh, anything else. So we do require that you buy the 5950 board to act as a reference design for your custom board. This way you can go back and forth and compare the performance of your design with the 5950 to help to, uh, understand what might be causing anything that isn't as good as as, um, as you'd like it to be, and um, it, it's extremely helpful as a reference. So just to put that in a in a few words or pictures here, <clears throat> you start with the 5950 as your reference design, and then using the design kit, the, the model 4801 we just looked at, you create your own custom carrier and you know, make it any size shape that you need. Uh, and then after you've got all done with it, you attach the Quartz XM module to your custom carrier, and then you compare its operation with the 5950 as a reference. So you can do all your software development on the um, 5950 while the hardware guys are working on the hardware carrier design. The software guys can be working on the um, FPGA design and the software design up in the ports, and you use that as a development platform to support um, what you're doing in your custom carrier and keep it as a long-term reference platform for going forward, perhaps into your next design. Uh, one example of a customer um, uh, we have is, is taking eight of our Quartz XM modules, putting them on a single uh, panel, a printed circuit board carrier that will fit behind a 64 element uh, phased array MIMO antenna. And then each of those modules can have eight transmit channels, eight receive channels. You need some RF circuitry in between the elements of the antenna, of course, and the uh, RF SOC chip. Um, but then you have a, an extremely compact, um, uh, uh, very swap friendly. Uh, uh, packaging where the antenna and the uh, front end, uh, back end processing and acquisition, digitizers, FPGA uh, connections can all be made, uh, you know, in a very close proximity to the antenna elements. Again, getting the software defined radio up closer to the antenna. So that's our 4801 Quartz XM carrier design kit. We also had a lot of customers who love the Quartz XM module, and they said, I like it, but I can't you send me something that I can use, you know, just a box that contains it? I don't want 3U VPX. I don't want PCI Express. I want a rugged box that has this in it. Can you build that small box for me? So we did. We came up with a relatively small package called our Model 6350 that has um, its sealed um mill style connectors all around it so so it's completely sealed package with uh, coaxial connectors on the uh, uh, on the side that that's facing away uh, for the analog inputs and outputs clocks gates and so forth and on the side that's facing us you bring in power usb gigabit ethernet jtag the dual 100 gigabit ethernet and uh, lvds io 
uh, to those connectors. These are, you can see, these are circular sealed uh, mill style connectors. It's available, it's, it's really designed for deployment in harsh applications, um, rugged conduction cooled to the outside, and then the outside can be either cooled with air, air jacket. You can see the air jackets that are attached here, those can be removed. If you have a cold plate, you can attach it directly to the cold plate. It's suitable for standalone operation because you can do everything inside this box, including receive, digitize, and, um, and generate um, signals through the data converters, do the processing, and do the communication, and then the payload data can come across the 100 gigabit ethernet. It's IP67 weather, weather, re, uh, weather rated. You, you also then, because of the fact that everything is inside, you use the ARM processor as your system controller. So that, hundred, that one gigabit ethernet can be used then as your system status monitor port to do your remote control monitoring of this. And then the 100 gigabit ethernets can be used for your payload data going digital data going up and down uh, into that uh, box. So how, would the, how is this deployed? Well, you connect coaxial analog RFIO, you connect dual 100 gigabit optical uh, uh, connections here, control and command over the one gigabit ethernet copper. It takes a 24 volt, uh, it's like you know 12 to 28 volts, I think, um, that comes up to power it single supply. You can mount this box uh, on a mast near your antenna, and you've got a complete eight-channel RF transceiver subsystem in a very small, compact, ready-to-use uh, box. So this, this has been extremely uh, popular, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be delivering that very soon to uh, first customers. The next carrier platform that we're uh, they're going to be releasing very shortly is a PCI Express carrier. Again, instead of using a 3U VPX carrier to, to hold the module, we, we use an open form factor, open standard form factor PCI Express and do the same thing in a different mechanical physical form factor with this PCI Express carrier. This gives you a very low cost PC development platform. You can do software and, and uh, FPGA development tools. Um, you could also use this for deploying RFSOC in any application where you have a benign environment, where there isn't a, a tough, um, you know, military environment. So this is really attractive to customers. If you take a look over it on the photo, you can see that we've combined the rear panel functions and the front panel functions onto the plates, the, uh, the uh, plates that, that would be in the rear of your uh, PCI Express chassis, where you've got your coaxial analog I.O. and uh, the processor I.O. in adjacent uh, dual slot um, configuration to get all the I.O. Uh, easily out through the back of your PC. This is a block diagram of the PCI Express board. If you'll notice, it looks almost identical to the same to the block diagram as our 3U VPX card. The difference um, primarily is just in the connectors and the mechanical form factor that we've used. All the same connections, the optical transceivers, everything is there, it's just in a different form factor. So that's our Quartz PCI Express board. And then, um, most recently, we've announced a SOSA-aligned RFSOC 3U VPX board. Now, many of you have heard about SOSA. It's the sensor open system architecture standard that's being developed by the open group, the SOSA open group. And um, it does recommend certain uh, features of 3U VPX that are aligned with the SOSA technical standard, which is not yet released, but it's still in development. Uh, here's the slot profile for it. It does have uh, 40 and 100 gigabit Ethernet um, data planes, um, expansion planes, control plane, maintenance ports. Um, it has the uh, in Intelligent Platform Management bus to support the Vita 46.11. That's one of the requirements of SOSA. Um, it has the dual 100 gigabit Ethernet support uh, for UDP and Vita 49.2. 
and it can use those new um, high density connections that we looked at before for the uh, RF and for the optical MT connections for the 100 gigabit Ethernet. And just as a, a quick view of that, here's the, the optical, I'm sorry, the RF signals that are going from the front of the board uh, out to the back uh, back plane over that uh, Vita 67.3C that we just looked at. We're only showing 10 of the cables installed so you can get a better picture of it. So that's the model 5550. For development tools, you need, again, the Vivado tools from uh, Xilinx. Now, now they're called Vitus, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. Um, it includes the IP integrator, which gives you graphical design entry, uh, AXI4 libraries, high-level synthesis, uh, simulators, and uh, uh, scripting language. From Pentech, you need a, a complementary package called our Pentech Navigator FDK or FPGA Design Kit, which includes a, com a complete Vivado project folder for our Quartz product. We have our own AXI4 compliant libraries with 140 different library modules. Full source code is included. And we also include uh, you know, things like DMA controllers, triggering, gating, timing synchronization, 100 gigabit ethernet engines, factory installed applications for radar and data acquisition, 100 gigabit ethernet streaming. These are included in the design. That's as shipped from the factory. So if you take a look at the the IP integrator, this is the, the, the Xilinx tool itself. It's an environment that can be used with um, you know, the installed factory installed IP modules, which you see there in the inset. And the FPGA design kit represents uh, what, what you get is you get a complete project that contains all of these blocks connected up to perform the functions that we include in the in the factory supplied design. Now, each of these modules that you see here are AXI4 compliant. Some of them are Xilinx modules, some of them are Pentec modules, but we designed all of our modules to be AXI4 compliant, but also to be um, made in a way that's identical with the way that Xilinx provides its IP modules. So the documentation is very similar. Um, we have, they have IP facts, we have IP facts, we, we have the table, the, the description, the features, and so forth. So it's very easy to go back and forth and mix the Xilinx and the uh, Xilinx libraries to create your project. We also include several applications, include a, a high bandwidth, wide, uh, wide band streaming application that acquires data from the A to D, sends it out through uh, 100 gigabit Ethernet port across the transceivers and then out through the Vita 66 back backplane on the dual 100 gigabit Ethernet. Here we can sustain two full rate raw data samples uh, on the two channels on two channels with the A to D. If you use the decimation, you can put out more channels at a lower uh, sampling rate uh, after decimation. Each of those uh, 100 gigabit Ethernet opt uh, optical channels can sustain 12 gigabytes per second, and each of each of the channels at four gigasamples per second with two bytes generates eight gigabytes per second. So we can deliver two full rate, full bandwidth raw data channels out through uh, the 100 gigabit Ethernet ports if you want. We also have other other applications. Here's another one where we do a similar thing on one channel. But then we also bring some data through into the PCI Express interface to go out perhaps to another processor, another destination. And of course, this can be done with real-time processing in the fabric, or you can take advantage of the DDR memory controller to move data into the DDR4 mem uh, SDRAM uh, for doing functions or other, uh, other functions in the FPGA that require data buffering as well. We have spent a lot of time working with the calibration. As you may know, uh, each of those four gigasample A to D converters is really eight 500 megasample uh, A to D converters time interleaved. Each of those eight sections or tiles must be fully calibrated um, for gain, offset, and linearity. 
we have come up with a combination of hardware, software, and calibration IP in the FPGA fabric that really makes that calibration optimal uh, and minimizes um, the, the spurs and other things that happen when the calibration is not done correctly. And that's all included in our product. For, for programming the processor section, the ARM processor, again, uh, Xilinx provides in their Bovado tools a complete ARM SD, SDK system design kit that gives you a complete development environment, debuggers, compilers, libraries, uh, command line tool, and so forth. Um, it's built on Xilinx's release of Linux called Peta Linux. And it, uh, it's um, their release of, uh, that they support, and it includes a, it's a full release of, of, of Linux uh, tools, utilities, and so forth. Again, Pentec provides a, ma a mating uh, package called the Pentec Navigator Board Support Package. It includes a command processor where high-level commands um, can be uh, executed uh, through a command processor that we've built. Um, that can come in across uh, PCI Express or Internet or Ethernet rather to uh, simplify your programming. So we have a, a really powerful tool suite that that does initialization, uh, deliberation, uh, deliveries all all the um, operational parameters, high level C language libraries with full source code provided, examples uh, of of code, device drivers for Windows and Linux. And we also provide a utility, which is really useful, which I'll show you a picture of a little bit later. Um, you can use the software development tool to create a lot of different scenarios. One could be a standalone software application that, that you load into the boot memory. And um, when you turn power on, the application comes up and the, the subsystem is really running on its own. Um, so it, it can really do a dedicated operation that is uh, fully self-contained. You can also then deliver the results uh, across gigabit Ethernet or use that gigabit Ethernet for control and status if you wish. You can also use the PCI Express to move data and control and status across it. And you can also deliver high-speed data across the Vita 66 for dual 100 gigabit Ethernet link. So it really depends on what you want to do with the data. Uh, some customer may just want to have analog in, analog out on the RF and not really have any external system connection at all. In other words, a complete self-contained self uh, box. Other customers may want to use our API command processor, in which case you can these are examples of some of the high-level API commands where you can initialize, set up different parameters from a very high level and save yourself having to go down into some of the, uh, the lower-level underlying uh, routines that, are, that, um, that these high-level functions control. You can send those high-level commands across uh, Ethernet or across PCI Express uh, to have the uh, board do what it needs to do. Here's a picture of that signal viewer I mentioned. What it allows you to do is to look at the frequency and the time domain of an acquired signal on the A to D converter and it's a fully instrumented virtual panel. It's, a, it's actually a lab view runtime application that comes along with our tools at no extra charge. So this, again, is a summary of, of the uh, Quartz product line that we've been talking about so far. Uh, and you can see all of these products are um, quite a, a collection and, and a coherent collection of different resources that you might need. And we have to thank Xilinx for the, uh, the uh, innovation of making the RFSOC chip itself that it contain all of these different uh, critical functions for a software radio, uh, radar, um, EW, and so forth, all in a single chip. We simplified using that technology in our Quartz XM module by making it available on a small module. Xilinx also has provided Vivado the tools for both ARM and um, FPGA development. We've provided our navigator tools for FPGA and uh, software processing um, that includes all the functions that we looked at before. 
And then uh, the bottom line here is all of this is then helping you speed your development cycle to save you development costs, get to market more quickly than if you were to start uh, working on a RFSOC chip design from scratch yourself. So there's a lot of different applications, um, you know, ranging from UAVs to missiles to um, uh, sensors to different remote um, land-based systems, uh, air, other airborne systems. There really is a, a new wealth of opportunities for taking advantage of that technology in the RFSOC. Moving forward, <clears throat> we have to take a look at, at the roadmap. The current generation, which is called the first generation, uh, which is what we're using right now, is the ZU27, the ZU28, gives you the 8A to D converters, 8D to A converters, and the interpolation and decimation that you see there. There's a second generation, which is um, basically 16 channels um, at half the, the sampling rates. And so um, in, instead, what we're doing is um, Taking a, taking a look at that, we looked at it, we said we really can't use it because it's in a different pinout package. It would mean redeveloping a brand new uh, Quartz XM module that was um, a huge effort. So instead, we you know, said we're going to jump over to the Gen 3, which is an improved version of the Gen 1, which is what we have, except it's got some really nice features. For example, six gigahertz analog bandwidth. By the way, the red type shows you what's different between the first generation and the third generation. So you can see the A to Ds and the D to A's are faster. Um, there's more bits, 14 bits on the D to A, on the A to D. And then there's a lot more steps of interpolation and decimation available here. Uh, the nice, the good news is that our Quartz XM product and all of our carrier-based products support both of these generations because the footprint on the two different Gen 1 and Gen 3 parts are compatible, footprint compatible. So that is really good news. And we are currently characterizing the Gen 3 part uh, right now. So if everything works well, um, we're going to have that available for sale quite soon. The next generation is Versal. Um, they're not going to have an RFSOC type that was with the A to D and D to A's out for a couple of years yet. There will be some earlier Versal parts out, which we're looking at as well. But as far as RFSOC technology, um, this is kind of what the, the near-term roadmap looks like. There's a lot of resources we have on our website. We have white papers. We have articles. We have seminars. We have performance reports giving you the AC specifications, um, you know, SFDR, A to D, D to A, latency. These are very interesting. We won two best in show awards for the product, the 6001, and then our Navigator FDK at major trade shows. You've probably seen some of our article, our, our advertisements featuring both the 3U VPX card and the small quartz XM module. We have an excellent quartz Buyer, buyer's guide that gives you a choice, a listing of all the different resources that we have, cables, development tools, hardware, software, chassis, options, and so forth. Um, it's really helpful to try to figure out exactly what you need. And we have live videos that show how the, how the board works on the lab. We have blogs, press releases, and uh, I really want to thank you. Uh, I went through this rather quickly because I had a lot of material but I really want to thank you for joining us today. And, um, you know, if you have any other questions um, right now, we'd like to, to you know, let uh, Ryan field them and I'll try to answer them. Thank you so much, Roger, for uh, synthesizing all that great information. Now is our time for uh, Q&A. So um, feel free to throw your questions into the chat box or you can use the Q&A module. I was very surprised there were no questions waiting for us, Roger, but um, I think everybody was tuned in and we'll just give them a, a moment or two here to send any questions that they may have. Yeah, I, I, while we're waiting, I just uh, I might want to mention that we have currently, I believe, 23 different customers 
who are who have bought and are developing with the custom carrier design kit, the model 4801, which means what they're doing is they're they're buying kind of like a starter package in terms of the hardware, um, you know, the 5950 with the eye towards taking that small module and putting it in, into a missile, a rocket, a weapon, um, a surveillance device. Um, there's a lot of different people out there doing a lot of different things around the world. And so we, in supporting all these customers for, you know, since um, I think it was a late of 20, late uh, 2018, that package has really become quite mature and we know how to support customers to do what they want to do, even though nobody's ever done such a thing before. They're doing it for the first time in that particular form factor. But um, we're really good at, at, at helping our customers get through this. And they are now starting to buy the Quartz XM modules in production quantities uh, to use on their own custom carrier that they developed using the 4801 design kit. So I know it's, it's, it, it, it sometimes seems a little daunting to get into this technology. Again, what we've tried to do is we've tried to make it as as easy for you as possible to um, to to take advantage of it. We have any questions yet? Um, I've got a couple comments. Uh, folks are giving me uh, some feedback on one of the downloads having issues, um, so I think I'll fix that. One question okay. that just just came in is: Can it be used for low bandwidth signals? Yes, it can. And the the way to do that is. The, the A to D converter, for example, has built-in decimations of up to eight. Uh, we also have in the standard factory product, we also have an additional decimator by a factor of one of 16, which gives you uh, an another, uh, well, total of 100, decimation of 128. Uh, so you can get the bandwidth down. Let's say you have a signal, for example, that's sitting at, um, I don't know, 1.8 gigahertz or something. You can you can use the tuner in the digital down converter to make that a center frequency and then decimate that by up to 128 to get the bandwidth down to a very narrow slice of the down converted, digital down converted band that you're looking at. And then secondly, you can operate the A to D converters down uh, from instead of four gigahertz, four giga samples per second, you can go down to a one giga sample per second rate and get, you know, an, then another factor of four effectively on the bandwidth reduction. And because of our IP library modules, you can extend the decimator rather easily in your FPGA design effort to make even narrower uh, bandwidths as well and still retain the right to tune uh, the center frequency of the band you're interested in across. Um, a rather wide range, uh, basically of um, you know the half sampling rate your Nyquist band, it, even uh, Nyquist in first zone and second zone uh, works quite well, up to four gigasample per second. Fantastic. Another question here: In the Quartz model six thousand one, are all channels not only synchronous but phase stable? Yes, they are. They're synchronous and phase stable. We find that the um, alignment in phase between uh, the channels uh, is, is measured in picoseconds. We find that there's much more um, of a phase shift problem in the cabling, you know, the customer's cabling and getting into the module from his um, RF sources. Uh, and again, if there are temperature effects, it tends to be more in the cabling uh, uh, and the delivery of the signals to our module rather than the effects that, that we have within the module itself. So again, because it has eight channels, it's extremely attractive to customers who have a lot of elements. And those often tend to be phased array customers where that um, stability of uh, phase alignment uh, uh, is essential for the operation uh, of the application. And so it's something that, that was 
um, let's say job number one, which we've done on all of our other products. And we, it was very difficult to do on this product because the documentation wasn't quite all there yet until maybe about a year ago. And now um, we've got it, we've got it decoded, worked out and kind of just ready to use. What is the A to D input range? The, the A to D input range on the Gen 1 device is about four giga, gigahertz, a 3 dB input bandwidth. Uh, you, so you don't, you really can't use it much above that. The, um, on the Gen 3, which is coming out um, in um, probably a few months, we'll be releasing that. The A to D sample rate goes up to five gigahertz and the input bandwidth uh, is at least up to 3 dB input bandwidth is at least up to six and and probably a little bit higher gigahertz. So what you can use that one for is sampling the five to six gigahertz band uh, as a, you know in a kind of an undersampling mode uh, to get really good performance in in that um, in that Nyquist band, uh, which would be third Nyquist zone. Uh, so that so I think I hope that answered the question. Very good. A couple more and we're going to wrap up. Uh, one here says, can I shut off clocks and power to the channels to save more power? Absolutely. What you can do is uh, a pair of A to Ds, and there are four pairs, can be shut off, uh, powered down in software so that you don't dissipate power. And you save uh, two, three watts or so every time you do that um, in power dissipation. And uh, you can also shut off the D to A converters. I believe those are sh those are uh, powered down in groups of four. Uh, it might be two, but it might be four. Is the RTM for sync module ready to ship? The RTM sync module, yeah, that is the oh the RTM for sync module. I understand that would be the uh, fifty nine hundred one dash um, what is it one hundred three? I think it is. Uh, that I believe is shipping. Yes. That, by the way, we, we started shipping that, uh, only this year because it took us a long time to, to get that all worked out and we had to respin it once. And, um, so that is, um, that's why that was a little bit later, but, um, now that, uh, the 5903, which is the three UVPX card and the rear transition module, which is a relatively simple printed circuit board assembly that doesn't have very much active circuitry on it. It basically brings out the sync connections uh, to the uh, rear panel. For people who don't have a rear transition module, you can, um, you can, use, you can wire the back plane, you can have, create a back plane, through your VPX back plane that brings the traces from the uh, VPX connectors where those sync signals come out across to other slots in your 3U VPX backplane and eliminate the need for the cables and the connectors entirely. So, so the point is it's nice sometimes during development to use the cables to connect up the different modules that are going to be synchronized, but then in deployment, uh, especially in conduction cooled small uh, form factor environment, you might want to have a custom VPX backplane where those signals are then uh, integrated into the backplane wiring. Okay. Um, I'm going to take this last one. For everybody else who's sending a couple more questions here, I'm going to go ahead and get these uh, to Roger offline and we'll make sure to respond to you directly. We have all your email addresses. Uh, since you registered to attend. Uh, one here, uh, just to finish up on, Roger, radiation okay. tolerance for space applications. Ah, we have several customers who are doing that right now, and we're working, kind of partnering with them in um, in investigating that. We, um, yeah, so, so I, I guess I can't, without divulging exactly who and what they're doing, let's say that we are um, gathering information and results uh, from testing and future testing that that's that's planned um, results of how they're going to work there there is a space grade version of the RFSOC chip that is extremely expensive so a lot of the um, low earth orbit applications um, 
are what they're trying to do is they're trying to use the standard uh, RFSO cheat. RFSOC chip, but they just want to test it to see how good it really behaves in operation. Um, and it really depends on the application and the expected lifetime of the satellite. Um, some satellites are relatively low cost and have a relatively low lifetime. And of course, for that uh, type of application, um, you know, this it might be a, a perfect solution. Um, so uh, it really depends on what you're doing, but we, we need to get we need to get the measurement data and the qualification of, of different exposure levels and, and rates and so forth all documented. We're in the process of doing that with one customer right now. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, I know there's a couple comments here regarding uh, issues with the handouts in the webinar. So I just wanted to make one more note that when you get the follow-up email, tomorrow with the video content and the links. We will include the PDFs from today uh, that were in the webinar, and I will go back and make sure that those are functioning as well. And the questions that have come in here towards the tail end, we'll reach out to you directly. We'll, we really wanna make sure you get your questions answered. Thank you all for taking the time. Thank you, Roger, for sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. Uh, we just absolutely love being partnered with Pentech and uh, serving this marketplace. Well, it goes both ways, Ryan, and, and thank you for sponsoring this, and thank you, everybody, for attending today. And feel free to re reach out to us, uh, reach out to, to Vic Myers Associates, and uh, we'll be sure. Uh, having a good conversation over the phone is what we like to do uh, to help customers understand things better. So feel free, and uh, we're here to answer your questions. Very good. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day, and stay safe out there. Bye, everybody.